we recently told a story about a lost Mira SV that we couldn't find. And I realized that we had never told probably one of the coolest stories that we've, we've encountered on our own channel. Uh, I, I think we told the story on VinWiki once. But to date, we've actually owned eight Miras, um, the myriad of SVs and P400 and S examples. But ironically, the first Mira that we had ever owned, um, I found by pure chance in a barn. So it, when we first started, I was scouring the internet at all times of the night and, and just constantly looking for cars. And we had done a few deals. We had done a Countach deal. We had done a Diablo deal. And one day, um, and let me preface this with the fact that at the time, we probably had a couple hundred thousand dollars to play with. So we were, we were much smaller than the place we are today. Um, we didn't really have much even operating cash. I didn't have much money. Um, we were a small, small company. And you could call this even before the official launch of Curated. We were using the name and maybe you know buying a car here or there. So I'm scrolling on the internet and uh, I find on eBay of all places this little ad for a 1967 Lamborghini Miura SS. And the ad was, it, it was not well written in the sense that um, some of the facts were incorrect. I believe it was, they were asking 1.25 million. So within line with you could say a Miura S price. But the biggest thing was the photos were horrible. So it was these um, photos that someone had cropped incorrectly. So they were very, very tiny. And obviously there's no such thing as a Mira SS. There's a Mira S, um, but there was never an SS or any special car produced. So I took note of it. Honestly, the ad looked sort of maybe like a fraud or a scam. Um, and I took a picture of the ad and I, I went about my day. And that night I'm in bed and I go, you know what, I, I should pursue that. You never know, who knows what it could be. So I quickly go back to it. I, I click on the, the user's name and I, I go to reach a send a message. Um, and and I, I can't remember exactly, but I think at some point immediately or before that the ad was taken down. But I did have the user on eBay, his contact information. So I sent a message through eBay. And I, I get a message right back, you know, hey, um, yes, I'm selling the car for my boss, uh, blah, 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 I would love to talk to you. So I end up, I get on the phone with this gentleman um, who was a very nice guy. You could tell his, his knowledge for cars was somewhat limited. And, you know, I'm trying to talk him through this process. The one thing I knew and the one thing that stood out to me in this eBay ad was there was a, a VIN number and the VIN number was four digits. Now, if you don't know Mira's, I don't think you would ever know um, how Mira VIN numbers are created. They were essentially four digits. Uh, you know, some of the first cars were like 1007, but most of the cars were 3460. And then, you know, the last cars were 500, et cetera. So you could tell, you know, between 3000 and 5000 what a Mira VIN looks like. And What's funny is when I saw that in the VIN number, I said, okay, there, maybe there's something here. Um, now, when I did run that VIN, nothing came up on the car. There was really no history on the car. So I did know that that part might have been real. Um, and I'm talking to this guy, and he's telling me it's a, it's a special example and blah, 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 blah. And uh, I asked him, do you have any better photos? Can you send me some cell phone photos? So a couple of hours go by, and my phone starts getting unloaded with photos. And I realize quickly, okay, this is a real Mira S. Um, it's definitely not a scam. I mean, these, you know, no one could create a Mira S from scratch and, and put it in a barn and make it look like this. So it's a real car. So there's something here. So immediately I start doing some research. I'm on the phone with him, we're negotiating. Now he tells me that his boss needs to close in like a week or in two days because the boss had some sort of financial commitment and he was selling everything. Um, he also had a Maserati Ghibli. Ironically, it was an SS and I think that's why he put an SS on the Mura. But um, so he was, he was in the process of just getting rid of everything. So without even having the money, I quickly <laughs> told him, done, we have a deal, we agreed to a price. Um, and I said I would send him a deposit in 
I forget what it was, maybe it was 72 hours or something like that. Now, remarkably, um, at the time, I had a dinner planned uh, about a day or two later with my now business partner who, who really helped us grow and he helped us get our bank financing and our funding and brought us to where we are today. And um, it, it came up in our dinner conversation about this Mira. And he's not a car guy, but he's a business guy and he's a sharp guy and he really liked um, Jordy and myself, my managing partner, and uh, he asked us about, you know, what deals do you have going or what's going on, and we told him about this Mira. And, and Jordy was, who's our finance guy, who at the time was raising money from investors and he was managing our money, was was basically telling him, man, this this guy is crazy. John's crazy. He signed a purchase agreement. He's planning to buy this car. We don't even have the money. So uh, Alan, who was not our partner at that point, he later became our partner, um, started laughing, and I'll never forget, he picks up a backpack at our dinner, and he takes out his checkbook, and he writes us a $50,000 check as a deposit for this car. And he tells Jordy, he says, okay, now it's your job to go raise the rest of the money, and he tells me it's your job to go buy and sell this car. So. What a momentous moment. I mean, I think we were about to cry because we were, this is seven, eight years ago in our careers. And um, I think both of us were struggling at the time, but we were just starting this new company. And uh, we obviously, we, we take the deposit money, we place the deposit on the car, and we start scrambling to raise the rest of the money. Jordy raises the money. Um, he had some friends and family investors who, who believed in what we were doing. And uh, I started scheduling flights to New York. So at the time, um, what, I, what I didn't realize was where I was actually going. I, I called a friend of mine, Wayne, who had a, a limo company. And the easiest way, you know, I didn't want to go rent a car. I, I wanted really to focus on just buying this Mira. So I said, hey, do you have a driver that could pick me up and bring me to this location? And he starts laughing. And he goes, you're going in the middle of nowhere in New York. I mean, like to a cornfield. I said, no, 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 it'd be fine. So he picks me up at the airport and uh, we start driving and we're driving. We're driving an hour now out of New York City and it's just like barns and corn, barns and more trees and we're nowhere. So at this point I'm trying to call the gentleman that was managing this transaction for his boss and I have no cell phone service. And it starts to like give me this weird feeling in my stomach that Maybe I was just taken for $50,000. Um, you know, and I definitely, listen, I verified. I saw a copy of the title and I saw like documents. But still, at that moment, this was one of our first deals. It was a lot of money for us. And I had to think like back to the eBay ad and like, could it be a fraud? Ends up, we get in a right location. The guy calls me and goes, hey, I actually see you guys. You're right down the street from a barn. Okay. So we see this barn. We pull up to the barn. And if I'm not mistaken, it was like this big white barn. And uh, he, he gets one of the, 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 the barn hands to open the doors. And I'm staring at literally what is farm equipment and a snowblower and all these different things. And this Mura, um, which was a, uh, a Mura red, which is like this orangish red, sitting almost like uh, in the sense of someone forgot about it from 1970. Um, and dust and, you know, there was a blanket on top and there's things on top of this mirror just sitting in the middle of the barn. And I'm astonished. I mean, I think I was so excited to discover this car. I forgot about even inspecting it. It was like, you know, I'm taking photos and doing all this stuff. So I'm looking at the car and I realized that, listen, this is a really well-preserved car. Um, at some point, apparently, the owner, who was a big guy in the stock world in the 70s, um, he was a young guy. You could see there was a Rolling Stones tape. I mean, you, you can't, I can't even imagine being a young guy in the 1970s driving a Mura S, uh, you know, around New York and, and listening to the Rolling Stones. I mean, it, it really brought me to that, that moment in time. Um, but he had redone the interior in probably 1970. And what was odd about the car was it had these glass louvers in the rear. Um, now, there had always been uh, rumors of maybe Bob Estes, who was the distributor for Lamborghini, creating a few mirrors with glass louvers. Um, when you looked at the louvers, they were very well constructed. Um, there was no one that could tell us it was, it was, 
it, it looked like it could have been done at the factory, but there was no proof it was done at the factory. We believe, and after speaking to actually Jim Kaminsky from the Lamborghini Club, that it could have been done by the U.S. distributor. So, so here was this car. And the car obviously didn't run, but we checked the engine. We put in gear and pushed it, so the engine did turn. And and really, you know, the paint had some cracking, but it was all complete. Um, and we decided, okay, let's move forward with it. Let's buy the car. So we ended up funding this car a couple days later. Um, we brought the car to Miami, and we and we took some incredible photos. And what a a incredible well-preserved example of a car with mostly original paint. Um, it had its original interior from the replacement in the 1970s. It was originally, I believe, a black interior. Someone had replaced it with like this white color, a white and gray color interior, but it had its antenna. It had on the, um, the, 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 uh, the brake reservoir, there's a cap that goes on the, the actual, the, 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 the cover for the reservoir, and it still had its original protectant cover. It had a lot of cool features that, you know, when mirrors got restored over the years, they were gone. Um, so you could tell it was an untouched car. So then it was our, our job to get it started. So we, we, I actually, at this point, we didn't have our restoration shop. We didn't have our guys here. So I sent it up to my father. I begged and pleaded. Um, he retired many years ago, and he agreed to get it running. So after a few days, he drained all the fuel, put fresh plugs, and it started to crank. And uh, he, what he realized was it, it didn't want to turn over. And then finally, he got it to, to run. And then guess what? A, a mouse and all these different, like, petrified artifacts came out of the exhaust. So that's actually why it didn't want to start. Um, and, and he just said, okay, I got it running. It just, it obviously needs everything else. Um, it hadn't run since the 1970s. Um, and we were trying to put together the whole story and apparently the owner had purchased the car and then he had literally in 1971 just put it away. Um, I think he had dented something on the front bumper and he got annoyed and he, and he literally just let the car sit. So it was an incredible story and what makes it sort of even funnier is how the story evolved and and the reason i say that is is and this might be the funniest part of the story is um you know i took these cool photos um this was uh before we were using our our current photographer albert at the time um now we'll send him on different missions but i brought a uh i, I think i had a nikon d something and i brought it and i took a couple photos and and they they came out really you know they came out cool um so we ended up selling the car. It went to a famous NHL hockey player, a, a sweet guy. Um, and then at some point he decided to resell the car. So when the car was being sold again, um, the story sort of evolved and people were calling me about this car. And there was actually a few guys in the auction world that were claiming that they had discovered the car by buying a snowblower or looking for an ad for a snowblower. So the story evolved and everyone started to use my photos. And I'm like, wait a minute, no, no, no. I actually discovered this car, and I'm the one that we had owned it at one point. Um, I think the last story I heard from a gentleman direct from his mouth was that he was looking in uh, Craigslist classifieds and he found a snowblower, and when he went to go pick it up, he found the mirror, um, which obviously I knew was not true. Um, and I laughed, and, and actually the car ended up selling at Mecham Auction uh, for about uh, I think it was like just over 1.1 or 1.2 million. Um, and, and I have never seen the car since. Um, I, had, I had followed sort of its history. I'm, I'm, I can imagine it might be being restored today um, or maybe someone left it original. Um, but it was definitely a momentous moment for us to discover the car, purchase the car, sell it. Um, and it's probably one of the reasons that uh, we ended up partnering with Alan.